Welcome to Expound, our weekly worship and verse-by-verse study of the Bible. Our goal is to expand your knowledge of the truth of God by explaining the Word of God in a way that is interactive, enjoyable, and congregational. We call this a textual community. Let's rejoice and learn God's Word in an interactive and enjoyable new way. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you, Father, for the gathering together of your people. Gather together because we have a common interest in spiritual things. We have a hunger for truth. And we find that living in this world surrounded with influences and value systems that are not yours, we need a frequent bath in truth. We also remember what Peter said, that we would grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we study his birth and his life, as we grow in the knowledge of Jesus, help us also to grow in the grace, which is his characteristic. In Jesus' name, amen. Just waiting for the alarm to end. Um, I I did ask these guys at the beginning if they'd ever looked up their ancestry, and I have noticed that um, discovering one's ancestry has become very popular in the last few years. There are several websites or computer programs that allow a person to do that. Uh, Ancestry.com is probably the most famous. Uh, Their tagline is, discover your story in history. Discover your story in history. And people, it seems, are interested in finding out their story, their family story, their family tree, and especially if they are related to a famous event or a famous person, and they find out that they're in the lineage of somebody who was at that event, that signing, that historic launch of a boat, or when the Mayflower came over, or a famous person who ruled. All of those things seem to be very interesting to uh, lots of people. I I was interested when we went to uh, New York last year to Ellis Island, and um, that stood in that great hall where so many came from all over the world to America, came to that harbor, and what it must have been like to see the Statue of Liberty as their boat sailed in and then docked at Ellis Island. And even Ellis Island provides a service on the computer that you can um, trace your ancestors and if they indeed came over on the boat, what boat it was, when it arrived, and get the manifest of that ship, who the captain was, who the other passengers were, and some of the history and where they came from. We're not surprised when we open up the Gospel of Matthew to discover 42 generations Jesus is traced back, 42 generations, and they're listed here in three different sections of 14 generations, all the way back to Abraham. Don't you think it's amazing that this one man who was born in a poor Jewish family, from a family that comes from the northern parts of Israel in an insignificant town, who later migrated to Bethlehem, that 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 boy born in that poor family, that after 2,000 years, people are still interested in his birth. And all over the world, once a year, the birth of Jesus Christ is either celebrated or acknowledged. I was shocked when I first went to Baghdad, Iraq. And out front of our hotel was a manger scene in a Muslim country, in a country hostile toward the West at that time. And there was baby Jesus in the manger, Mary and Joseph, the wise men, the shepherds. And not only in front of our hotel, I thought, well, it's because Americans are here, but all over Baghdad, I saw signs, Merry Christmas, and manger scenes. And it just, it dawned on me that this poor Jewish carpenter is acknowledged after 2,000 years of history. Why is that? 
Well, that's partly answered in chapter 1, verse 18, where we look now. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed, that's that formal period of engagement to Joseph, before they came together, that is, before they were united as husband and wife, she was found with child, pregnant, of the Holy Spirit. You can now see what Matthew is up to. He has recorded 42 generations of natural birth, and now he inserts a supernatural birth, the virgin birth. The singular event that happened to only one person historically, and that is Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. As amazing as it is that people all over the world acknowledge or celebrate Christmas, what is sad to me is that there's a number of Americans who identify themselves as Christians who will say that the birth of Jesus Christ is not the most important part of Christmas. Doesn't that amaze you? George Barna and his research group interviewed and assessed American belief systems. Of the research that they did, they found 88% of the group that they researched, 88% claimed to be Christians, and only 37% of that group thought that the birth of Jesus was the most important part of Christmas. Others said it was about gifts, giving and receiving, family love, get-togethers, that kind of thing. What makes it so unique and why we should be excited about the birth of Jesus in this world, one of the things is the virgin birth of Christ. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, predicted by Isaiah the prophet. You probably already know that scripture in Isaiah 7. The Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. That was the prediction made by Isaiah the prophet of a virgin birth. Now, some people try to talk their way out of this, and they'll say things like, well, you know, virgin birth is even known in our physical world, in the scientific world. We have a thing called parthenogenesis. And they'll point to the honeybee as one of their examples. That the unfertilized egg of a honeybee can develop and does develop into a drone, a male bee. Or they will say, uh, certain sea urchins or marine worms, when placed in different salt solutions, uh, they, those eggs begin to develop, take on different forms. Or they'll point back to what happened in 1940 when a rabbit was developed by chemical and temperature influences placed upon the ova that caused the development of that rabbit. And they'll say, see, that's parthenogenesis. That's not an unknown phenomenon. It's quite common. Perhaps, but not in the human realm. The idea of a human being born in the virgin womb of a woman was unheard of, so much so that even after it happened, as we will discover as we go through the Gospels, Jesus was scorned. Mary was scorned. There was a stigma placed upon the family like, yeah, right, a virgin birth. We all believe that. And so when Jesus was confronting the scribes and the Pharisees at one point, they intimated about this. In John chapter 8, they said, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, and that is God. Intimating we were not born of fornication, but probably you were. The idea posited by some is that Mary probably must have had some relation with an unnamed Roman soldier in a garrison in Galilee. So it wasn't a virgin birth. It was an illicit birth. The Bible is clear on this. Before they came together, she was found with child by the Holy Spirit. 
Then Joseph, her husband, being a just or a righteous man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Now Joseph, since he wasn't the actual father, and he didn't know who the father was, he just probably thought she had some kind of sexual relations with someone, and uh, I can't marry her, I'm a just man, I have standards that I go by, and I'm not going to lower my standards, I want to serve God, so I don't want to hurt Mary, I do love her, so perhaps I can divorce her secretly before she really starts to show, and I can protect her and hide her away. But he was minded to end the relationship. Now, we know it didn't happen, and Joseph and Mary did come together, and they were a married couple. Joseph is the adopted father of Jesus, but not the actual father. But he was the legal father of Jesus. Okay, so this is where I want you to tune in for a moment. If you read through the Gospels, especially Matthew and Luke, you discover genealogies. We read one last week. That's Matthew's genealogy. Luke also has a genealogy of Christ, but it's different. Now, we know that Matthew's is the genealogy of Joseph because Joseph's father is mentioned. And so we believe that Luke is showing us the genealogy of Mary because a man named Heli is mentioned, which was not the father of Joseph. His father, Yaakov, is mentioned in Matthew. But his father-in-law was probably Heli, that's Mary's dad, and her genealogical record gets traced. There's also a difference in the way they're written. Matthew is a descending genealogy. Luke is an ascending genealogy. Luke descends from Abraham all the way down to Joseph. Luke ascends from Heli, the father of Joseph, all the way back to David and to Abraham, etc. But why two genealogies? Well, if you just go back and look at verse 16, You'll notice it says, Jacob begot Joseph. So that was his father, Yaakov, Jacob. Not the one in the Old Testament, obviously, a different one. Jacob begot Joseph. Now, notice it says, the husband of Mary. It doesn't say the father of Jesus. But he's shown as the husband of Mary, of whom, that is Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So Joseph will show and provides, his genealogy here in Matthew, provides the legal authority for Jesus to be at the throne of David, while Luke shows not the legal authority, but the racial purity. You're saying, I I'm a little bit lost. Why is that important? It's absolutely important. And this is why the virgin birth is so necessary to believe. Just go back a few verses. Keep following me here. I'll put it all together. Look at verse 11 of chapter 1. We have Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And if you remember, I ask you to remember that name, Jeconiah. Jeconiah was one of the kings of Judah. But something happened to Jeconiah that poses a threat to the entire dynasty of King David, the entire line of King David. His bloodline gets cursed. I'd like you to see that. Keep a marker here and go back to Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah 22 in your Bibles. Now, I've cheated because I put a ribbon marker there so I can get to it easy in advance, but just turn to... Jeremiah 22, and watch something here. In Jeremiah 22, we have an incredibly huge problem that cannot be solved unless there is a virgin birth. In verse 24 of chapter 22 of Jeremiah, as I live, says the Lord, though Coniah, which is the short form of Jeconiah, Though Kaniah, or Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off 
and I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life and into the hand of those face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and the hand of the Chaldeans. So I will cast you out and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. But to the land to which they desire to return, there they shall not return. Is this man, Kaniah, a despised, broken vessel, or idol, a vessel in which there is no pleasure? Why are they cast, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless. A man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Write this man down as childless. It doesn't mean he didn't have children. He did have sons, but none of them succeeded him to the throne. His bloodline gets cursed here. Now, he's the king of Judah. And the way it works is there's a succession from King David all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, until we get to Jeconiah. And now this man, his bloodline is cursed. None of his descendants, God says, will sit upon the throne. That's a problem, especially since the Messiah has to be of the lineage of King David and follow that dynastic succession. We have a problem. The bloodline is cursed, especially when we get to Jeremiah 33, where it says that not, uh, there will never be a descendant that will cease to sit upon the throne of David. God promised a descendant of King David to sit upon the throne, but here it says Jeconiah is cursed. Jeconiah's sons never succeeded him. His uncle succeeded him because of this curse that God pronounced. Okay, so how is the Messiah, the son of David, going to qualify to be the legal and pure son of David if the bloodline is cursed? Well, that's where we come to two genealogies. Matthew will show you that Jesus has the legal right to the throne of David all the way back through Jeconiah to King David, because it's mentioned, as we read in Matthew, Jeconiah was mentioned, but you say the bloodline is cursed. Exactly. Jesus Christ was not the actual son of Joseph in the bloodline, only the legal son of Joseph, because Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Luke shows you the purity of the bloodline, but Mary's genealogy bypasses Jeconiah bypasses Solomon, and goes back to King David through a different son of David named Nathan. Not Jeconiah, not Solomon. So we have a pure bloodline, untainted. Jeconiah is out of the picture with Mary. Jeconiah is in the picture with Joseph, but that provides the legal right for Jesus to occupy the throne of David. But because Jesus wasn't the actual son of Joseph, he has the legal right, but maintains the purity of bloodline from Mary. Does that help? Do you understand that? So now we understand why there are two genealogies and why the virgin birth was so important. God pronounces a curse on the bloodline. Then he gets around his own curse by providing a virgin-born Messiah. So he can keep his promise. Jeconiah, your bloodline is cursed from here on out, but I will have the son of David with a pure bloodline all the way back to King David. He has the legal right through his stepfather or adopted father, Joseph, but the legal and the racial purity that comes through Mary. So we have those two genealogies. I hope that clears it up a bit. Verse 19 of chapter 1 of Matthew. Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the 
anglicized form. It comes from the Greek form of the Hebrew Yeshua. Um, it's the shortened form of Yehoshua or Joshua or Jehoshua. It all means the same thing. It means Yahweh, or God, the Lord, is salvation. You will call his name Jesus. God is salvation, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, now we get the quote from Isaiah the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, the term Emmanuel is a title or a description. It is not a formal name. It is not a personal name. He will, by his description, be God in human flesh, God with us, Emmanuel. So remember, it's a title. It's a description. It's not a personal name. This prophecy was given by Isaiah 600 years before the birth of Jesus. Now let me, if you don't mind, tell you about how it happened. Can I tell you the story of how the prophecy came? Because if you go home and read it, you'll go, man, that's, a, that's pretty confusing. Here's how it came down. The king at that time was named King Ahaz, a real scoundrel, wicked dude. His dad was pretty cool, Uzziah, a very righteous king, reigned for 52 years in Judah, but his son Ahaz takes over. Ahaz was wicked, brought idolatry back into Judah, even sacrificed one of his sons, burning his son to death at the altar of Molech. Wicked. There were two kings at that time who were above him. What I mean by that is geographically uh, they were above him. In the northern kingdom of Israel and in the country of Syria. The king in Syria was named Rezin. The king in Israel was called Pekah. And Pekah and Rezin didn't like Ahaz, so they thought, let's depose him, kick him off the throne, and we'll put a king in his place that will do what we want him to do. So what Ahaz does when he finds out their plan is he makes an alliance with another nation, the nation of Assyria. The king's name was Tiglath-Pileser. And he asks Tiglath-Pileser, hey, let's be buddies, Tiglath. And uh, let's make an alliance, because these guys are trying to kick me off the throne, but you're a big gun. You're Assyria. You can help me, and we can form an alliance, and you can take care and protect me. So he makes an alliance. When he does, Isaiah the prophet comes to Ahaz and basically says, shame on you, Ahaz. Why would you trust a king rather than the Lord, your king? Why wouldn't you trust God for protection? And he rebukes him for not trusting the Lord, but making a human alliance. Later on, Isaiah the prophet comes to him a second time. And he wants to assure the king that God will make sure that those two kings in the north that want to depose him won't have their way, that God will protect Judah and the royal seed. Ahaz doesn't want to have anything to do with Isaiah the prophet. And Isaiah said, Ahaz, listen to me. Ask God for a sign. He goes, I'm not going to ask God for a sign. So Isaiah said, well, God's going to give you one anyway. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. You say, what kind of a sign was that to a king in Israel, especially about a boy who wouldn't be born for 600 years? Well, first of all, when Isaiah said, God will give you a sign, the you in Hebrew is plural you. It's not just you, the king, but you, the entire nation, will have a sign. It's a sign for the nation, not just one man. And the idea was is that God is going to protect his interest in the lineage of King David. He's going to make sure that he fulfills his promise, and the promise will be fulfilled in the virgin-born Emmanuel. Okay. You're with me, right? Around the same time, another sign was given to and through Isaiah the prophet. The Lord said, Isaiah, this is in the very next chapter in Isaiah chapter 8, you're going to have a son, 
and you should name him this. Here's the name God told him to call him. Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Now, you parents that are looking for biblical names, thank God you're not Isaiah the prophet. Imagine having to get it, dedicate Maher Shalal Hashbaz to the Lord. And here's what God said. Before your son is even weaned, those two nations up north are going to be forsaken. And true enough, before that little boy, Mahar Shalal Hajbaz, was three years old, those two kings that were threatening the kingdom of Judah died. And the signs were the same, even as Isaiah's son was the proof and the prediction that God would ensure the future of the royal seed of David, the ultimate fulfillment would come 600 years later when the virgin-born Son of God would be the King of the Jews, the King of Israel, the fulfilled Messiah. So that, that's that context of the promise in Isaiah chapter 7, um, because if you go and you read it, you go, boy, it, it's just it's tough to unravel, tough to understand. So, you will call his name Emmanuel, verse 23, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took to him his wife and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. i got to let you in on something else. Those who are liberal scholars like to point out what they see as a problem with the text of Isaiah chapter 7. The text in English says, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. And the Hebrew word is alma. And the liberal scholars will say, Well, alma doesn't necessarily mean a virgin. It simply means a young lady. Not a virgin, just a young woman. Now, whenever I hear that, my, my immediate question is, how would that be a sign to anyone? Behold, a young woman will have a baby. That happens like every day, all the time. There's no sign there. The sign is a virgin having a baby. Now, that's a sign. That doesn't happen every day. Also, when the liberal scholar says that could mean a young woman, they have a huge problem. Because when the translators in Alexandria, Egypt, of the Septuagint version of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek, made the translation of Alma in Isaiah 7. They chose the Greek word Parthenos. Behold, a Parthenos will have a son. And in Greek, it can only mean a virgin, not a young woman, always a virgin. They understood the meaning of Alma. They translated it way before Jesus was even born as a Parthenos, a virgin-born child. So no getting around the virgin birth, no skirting it. It's a cardinal doctrine. It's one of the creeds the church has believed in from the beginning, part of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And so the Virgin brought forth the Son. Joseph was warned, was told by the angel, and so he named his son Jesus. Something else. It wasn't just Isaiah that predicted the virgin birth. I believe we see it predicted in Genesis chapter 3. There's a phrase. Do you remember it since we studied it? Well, it wasn't that long ago, right? Genesis, just a couple books ago. <laughs> in Genesis 3, there's that phrase, the seed of the woman. Remember that? The seed of the woman will crush the serpent. The seed of the woman? Now, that's, a, that's an oxymoron, because we know something biologically as well as theologically that the seed doesn't come from the woman, but from the man. So when it talks about the seed of the woman, we have something very unique. Mary was the only woman who had within her the seed that produced a child that did not come from a man, from a human being, but from the Holy Spirit. 
So the virgin birth, I believe, was predicted way back in Genesis chapter 3. Jesus Christ was the only person who existed before he was born. He existed in eternity past as the eternal Son of God. He, for a time, was placed on this earth in the virgin womb of a young woman named Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born. He died. He was raised from the dead. Now look at that last verse, verse 25. He did not know her, notice, until she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Mary did not stay a virgin. She was a virgin when Jesus was born, but after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary had normal relationships, they had sexual relationships, and they produced other children. I was brought up with an idea in the Catholic Church of the perpetual virginity of Mary, that Mary was a virgin and stayed a virgin. Now, that, that's a doctrine that doesn't come from the Bible. It doesn't really come from early church tradition. It comes later on by one of the popes around the 600, 649, Pope Martin came up with that one. But if you were to turn, for example, to Matthew chapter 13, there's a list of his brothers and sisters. Matthew 13, I'm reading verse 54. When he had come to his own country, that's Nazareth, he taught them in their synagogue. So they were astonished and they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon? and Judas, he had four brothers, they're named here, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get these things? So Jesus had brothers and sisters, but he himself was born of the virgin. So now chapter 2 of Matthew. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, we all know the story. It's the story of the wise men and the unwise king. But though we know the story and we pay tribute to it every Christmas season, we really don't know who they were we don't know how many there were. Um, tradition has embellished the story. In the Middle Ages, names were given to the wise men. And because there are three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, it is supposed that there were three wise men. But it doesn't say there were three wise men, just that there were three gifts. There was actually a song written in the 1800s, and that's where we got the idea. We three kings of Orient are... Bearing gifts, we traverse afar. Field and fountain, moor and mountain, you know the song, you sing it. But it doesn't say that there were three, and even though in medieval times they were given names, Casper, Balthazar, and Melchior, the text doesn't say that. All of that stuff is made up. So who were these guys? Well, the word in Greek is magoi. We get the term magi from it. We also get the term magician from it. We also get the term magistrate from it, somebody who adjudicates at law. Magi, magician or magic, magistrate. It is believed that the magi come from Mesopotamia, from Babylon, and then from Medo-Persia, that they were a priestly caste of the Medes, and, according to Herodotus, the Greek historian, they specialized in reading the dreams of people. Now, we understand from reading the book of Daniel that there were wise men in Babylon, 
And Nebuchadnezzar had troubling dreams. Daniel interprets the dreams. Daniel is eventually placed as the chief over all of the magoi, over all of the magoi, over the wise men of Babylon. According to history, the magi were Semitic. They were Semites. They were related to the Jewish race. They were sons of Shem. They were also monotheistic. They had that in their belief system. It is also thought that since Daniel himself was the chief over all the magi of Babylon, that no doubt since he was there over them and there were the Jews in captivity for 70 years and many stayed afterwards, that Daniel and others influenced the magi in telling them about this coming ruler, the Messiah. Daniel received so many intricate prophecies about the Messiah and his coming. So he primed the pump and got them ready to receive a future king of Israel. I don't know, I can't prove it, but maybe he even shared that beautiful prophecy out of the book of Numbers where it says, a star will arise in Judah and a king will come from Israel. And so they came to Jerusalem primed and ready, following some astronomical sight, saying, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? Well, it said, when Herod the king, verse 3, heard this, he was troubled, literally agitated or shaken to the core, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, you know why that is? Let me tell you a little bit about Herod, because you read a lot about him in the New Testament. Herod was not Jewish. The Jews hated him. So he tried to do a lot of things to incur their favor. He himself was an Idumean. He was from the other side of the Dead Sea in the country of Edom or Jordan. He um, had a father named Antipater, and Antipater had done a favor for Rome, and so Julius Caesar gave to Antipater the area of Judea to rule over as a gift. I'm giving you the Jews, I'm giving you Judea, you can rule over them. In fact, I'll give you an army, and you can call yourself by this title, the King of the Jews. Herod now succeeded Antipater, and Herod the Great loved the title King of the Jews. He was the King of the Jews. The Jews hated him. But he called himself the King of the Jews because Julius Caesar allowed him that title. And he was willing to kill anyone and put away anyone that he saw as a threat to his position as the king of the Jews. Okay, he realizes, I'm in, I, I'm in Jewish country here, man. This is Judea. There's Jews all around. I am not Jewish. So he marries a Jewish wife. He had several wives. One of them was called Miriamne. She was not only Jewish, she was Hasmonean. Remember that term from last week? Uh, Judas Maccabeus and those ones who revolted and brought forth uh, the temple reinstitution and Hanukkah. So she came from that background. She was Hashmini and she was Jewish and he did that again to incur the, the favor of the Jews. He also built them a temple and built them many things uh, that they could enjoy their lives with. But because he was a wicked man and a paranoid man and sought to kill anyone who might even take the kingdom from him, he eventually killed his wife, Miriamne. He didn't trust her. He killed his two oldest sons so they couldn't take the throne. He killed his brother-in-law, the brother of Miriamne, because he thought, he's trying to steal my kingdom. So he just started killing people. It got to be so crazy that one of the sayings that went about back then was this, it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is to be his own child. It was so bad that when Herod was on his deathbed, he knew he had no time left. He ordered all of the prominent citizens of Jerusalem to be arrested, imprisoned, and when he died, the order was, as soon as I die, kill all those prominent citizens of Jerusalem. And here's his rationale. I know that when I die, nobody will weep for me. So I want to make sure that there's weeping at my death. Kill them. So now you can understand the paranoia when these magi, these kingmakers, oh, by the way, 
it was thought that whatever the Magi said was considered to be the law of the Medes and the Persians. You remember that from the Old Testament, Daniel, the law of the Medes and the Persians. When that was put into effect, it was irrevocable law. So these were magistrates. They laid down law for Mesopotamian rulers. They identified kings and put the seal of approval on authority. So for them to make a long journey, hundreds of miles through the desert to identify the king of the Jews, you can understand why this man, who called himself the king of the Jews, would be absolutely paranoid. So he asks his chief priests in verse 4 and 5, where is this Christ to be born? Notice they have the answer immediately. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, and then they quote the prophet. You remember Bethlehem and its significance in biblical history? Bethlehem is where Jacob buries his wife, Rachel. Bethlehem is where Ruth meets and marries Boaz. Bethlehem is where David grows up. He's born and is raised in Bethlehem. So much so that Bethlehem becomes known as the city of David. Now the word Bethlehem is from two Hebrew words, Beit, which means house or place of, and Lechem, which means bread. It means the place of bread because it was the bread basket of Israel. The wheat was grown in those valleys around Bethlehem. That's where Ruth and Boaz were out in the fields when she was gleaning. So it means the house of bread, the place of bread. How significant that the bread of life would be born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. With all that rich biblical history, the city of David, because he was from the lineage of David and would sit on the throne of David. But they said, verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Okay, here's what blows my mind. These were like professional clergymen. These were the priests. They're asked a biblical question, and they can come up with the answer immediately. They didn't have to say, "Uh, I don't know, let me go uh, onto my Lagos program on my computer and and let, let me just run a quick Bible search. They could quote chapter and verse. They they could pull out of their memory the 8th century B.C. prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, but you Bethlehem. They knew the verse. They knew the scripture. But what amazes me is they didn't even get up to check out if this could be the fulfillment of that promise. Bethlehem's only a five-mile walk. It's the outskirts of Jerusalem. It's very close. Here these magi had taken a long, arduous trip over the plains, through the desert. They've expended money. They've expended energy. And here's these guys just a few miles away who go, Oh, yeah, there's a prophecy. Uh, He's probably born in Bethlehem. That's what it says. So get up and check it out. You'd think one of them would say, let's go with these guys. See if this is right. Here's my point. You can know a lot about the Bible. You can quote chapter and verse. You can have your little Bible memory verses and have it all down. And you can do everything short of putting it into practice. James says, be doers of the word, not just hearers only, because when you do that, you deceive yourselves. These men were deceived. They knew chapter and verse, but they didn't want to go check it out. I pray that none of us are like that. I pray that we would grow in knowledge, but as I pray, grow in grace. It would change our lives. That we will never become like one pundit said, inoculated with a mild form of Christianity so as to be rendered immune from the real thing. You know, you just get enough of the Christianity inoculated in you, and you you can just kind of go to a place where you hear the truth and you are exposed to the truth, but it never penetrates into the heart. Listen well, churchgoers and Bible studiers. Are you hungry for him Not just knowledge about him, but him personally. Pursuing him. All they had to do was make a personal application and check it out. They didn't do it. Then Herod, 
when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Now, we hear that and we go, yeah, right, like not going to happen. But he pretends to be a worshiper. He claims to be a worshiper. And not everyone who claims to be a worshiper is a worshiper. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Now watch this. Until it came and stood over where the young child was. There's been so many uh, theories and conjectures as to what this star really was. I've read articles on it. I've read commentaries about it. Some say it was Jupiter, the king of planets. Others say it was a combination of the alignment of Saturn and Jupiter in the shape of a fish, which was the early symbol of Christianity. Others say it's a uh, um, low-flying meteorite. Others have said it's an errant comet that showed up in the sky, in the night sky. Others have said it's an inner vision. It really wasn't real, just it was the inner star. <laughs> Your own personal, like, inner light thing you knew, my, like, inner star. And... Now, in hearing all of those theories, I don't know that I believe any of them, simply because it says the star stopped. It stood still. It was apparently moving, and then it stood still over where Jesus was. Comets typically don't do that, nor do meteorites, nor does Saturn or the other planets. Especially the inner light isn't going to do that. Oh, wait a minute. I'm feeling it, the inner light, the inner, the inner. There it is, right here. Here's a theory. Here's a thought. Let me throw this out at you. Perhaps this was the glory of God. I'll explain. The shepherds were out in the fields watching their flocks at night, and an angel came to speak to them, and it says, the glory of the Lord shone round about them. There was some visible, light-like manifestation. It was light where they were at. It shone around them. We were in the book of Exodus, and we remember that there was a visible manifestation of the presence of God, the glory of God, over the tabernacle, a pillar of fire by night, a sign that led them, that stopped and started and stopped and started. That Shekinah glory of God could be exactly what these wise men saw, this sign that was put up in the sky like a star, and they followed it. And it would be so symbolic because just like the children of Israel were being delivered and had been delivered from the bondage of Pharaoh, so here was the sign of the Messiah who would deliver the world from the bondage of sin forever. And so in like manner, they got this sign. It stood, it says, over where the young child was. Notice that young child. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. He's not called a baby anymore. He's called a young child. He's not in a manger any longer. He's in a house. Time has passed. The child has been circumcised. Mary's purification, 30, 60 days, is over with. The child has grown. He's probably no more than six months old, but probably uh, several months old by the time the wise men came. They didn't come Christmas Eve or Christmas night when the baby was born. I know you see the manger scene. There's the wise men. There's the baby. There's the shepherds. They're all kind of hanging out together. <laughs> this is long after the shepherds. They're now in their own home in Bethlehem. And he's not called a baby, but he's called a young child. Don't you find it interesting that the first group to worship the king of the Jews was not the Jews? They wouldn't even go check it out. It was a group of Gentiles. How prophetic that the gospel would go into all the world. What a, what a, what a prediction even of what 
the last words of Jesus to his disciples were, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These Gentiles, probably primed by Daniel the prophet, were the first to worship Jesus. And it says, and the text is very clear and wants to draw your attention to, they worshiped him. They did not worship Mary and him. They worshiped only him. He and he alone was the object of their worship. When they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, and there are three, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It was always customary to give a superior a gift when you were in his presence. They recognized he was the king of the Jews. They recognized he was royalty. They recognized he would be Emmanuel because they worshiped him, and so they bring gold. Gold was the king of metals, and the metal fit for a king. Uh, Typically, you'd never appear before an ancient monarch without some gift of gold. I don't know how much gold, but it was probably enough to fund their trip into Egypt, and probably that's how Joseph paid for that long excursion into Egypt, to go there and come back, probably from the gifts of the wise men, especially the gold. Next on the list is frankincense. That's a, that's a gum resin that was used by the priests. The priests would offer frankincense with the meal offering. So Jesus, gold, a medal for the king of kings. Frankincense, he is the great high priest. Oh, by the way, Frankincense hardens into these little crystals, and it doesn't give off its scent except one time you have to crush it. When you crush it, it gives off a sweet aroma. Remember Isaiah 53? He was pierced for our sins or iniquities. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Next on the list is myrrh. Myrrh is a sap that comes from a tree in Saudi Arabia. It was used for perfume. It was a spice. But it was also used as an embalming fluid. When Jesus died, 100 pounds of spice, myrrh, it says, and aloes was mixed for his burial. So it was typically used as an embalming fluid. Now, of all the gifts you would want to get as a parent for your baby, I doubt embalming fluid would be on your list. And if somebody gave you a little package mark, embalming fluid, you would be terribly put out and offended. Talk about the gift that bombs. (laughs) Embalming fluid would certainly be it. But again, this is a prediction, a prophecy, that he would die for the sin of the world, I believe. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother. Again, notice the word order. The angel didn't say, Take Mary, or take the mother and the young child. Take the young child and the mother. In ancient writing, this was never done. The word order was always the adult first, then the child. But here, the centrality of Christ is being highlighted, so it's first the child, then the mother. Flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son." Egypt is only 75 miles away from Israel, that is border to border, or from Bethlehem where they were to the border, 75 miles, but it was 150 miles from Bethlehem to the big city where they probably went, Alexandria, Egypt. Now I say they went to Alexandria because there was an enclave of Jews given protection by Alexander the Great at the city named after him, a a million Jews with synagogues and schools. So they would have felt at home there. Philo, the great historian, came from Alexandria. The Septuagint, that translation of the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek by those 72 scholars, took place at Alexandria. They would have felt at home there, nourished in Egypt. Then Herod, verse 16, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, 
was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all of its districts from two years old and under to cover all the bases according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then it was fulfilled with what was spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. And he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now the time's up. But it's interesting that Matthew quotes a prophecy of Jeremiah up in verse 17 and 18. A voice that is heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. When Jeremiah gave that prediction, what he was predicting was the Babylonian captivity and how the Babylonians would come in and kill people and take others of them captive. And the result would be Jewish mothers under the title Rachel. Why Rachel? Because Rachel was the mother of the Joseph and Benjamin, the, the favored wife of Jacob. And she was the one who cried out, saying, Give me children or else I die. So Jewish mothers would typically identify them, themselves with Rachel. And the idea of Rachel weeping for her children are Jewish moms who are weeping for sons and husbands and daughters who have been killed by the Babylonians whom Jeremiah predicted. What Matthew is simply saying is what happened with Babylon prefigured what would happen when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So one was a, a, a type of another, you might say. And then verse 23, we don't have really time to cover that. We'll just touch on it next week as we get into chapter 3. And he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Let's pray. Our Father, we love studying about the one who saved us, Jesus, who would take away our sin, who would save his people from their sins. We love studying about Emmanuel, God with us, and so thankful that this virgin-born, one from heaven, one who was with you from eternity past, stepped into our world. And being a man, he could understand what we go through, what we experience. As a man, he could suffer what men suffer, what women suffer. As a man, he could die the death that we die but as being God, having the nature of God and the nature of man. He was the sinless atonement, sinless sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. Or we um, confess we don't totally understand it, we don't totally get it, but we marvel nonetheless and we do worship, even as these men who were called wise men Anyone is wise who worships Christ. Anyone is a fool who pretends to be like Herod, a worshiper of Christ, or like these religious folks who knew the scriptures but didn't know their Lord, or even get motivated enough to find out if the scripture was fulfilled. Lord, I, I pray that we as churchgoers and Bible studiers 
would seek the living God, would seek the relationship and the communion with God, that we wouldn't turn into just a church that is a school, because then it wouldn't really be a body of Christ, it would just be a mouth and a set of ears. But as the body of Christ, we're all connected to one another and to you to find out what your purpose is for us and to be a part of the process of changing lives. Thank you, Lord, that we have a night where we can go in depth and we can study these things. In Jesus' name, amen.